Good morning. Welcome to South End Baptist Church this morning. Um, unfortunately, Pastor Mike is a little under the weather this morning, so uh, we are going to have Bruce Conley filling in and preaching for him a little later today. Luckily, he was available on short notice. Um, we always are welcome and love when Bruce is able to come and, and preach for us. So uh, um, if you'll join with me, I'll open us in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you for the day that you've given us to be able to, to come here and meet and worship, dear Lord. And as we go into this time of worship, we just lift up this whole service to you in your precious son's name. Amen. Chelsea. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. How's everybody doing? You enjoying this nice, cool weather? Yeah. yeah. Well, somebody's fine. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we stand and why don't you greet the person next to you and tell them that you're happy you're in church.
Once again, thank you for worshiping us here in person or those that are joining online. Um, again, we just thank you for worshiping with us today. As I did mention earlier, Pastor Mike is under under the weather, so we'll lift him up in prayer here in a minute. And we'll also lift up Bruce to come and preach the word that God's given to him to present to us today. And uh, just again, thankful that he's able to be here. So join with me in prayer. Dear Lord, just again, we come to you now. We thank you for this time that we've had to lift up to you and in praise and song, dear Lord, and now as we go into this time of looking at what your word has to say to us and what you've presented to, to Bruce to, to preach to us, dear Lord, and just uh, lift up Pastor Mike to you and, and just uh, continue healing him to, to be able to feel better and be back with us next week, dear Lord, and 
Um, again, just lift up the rest of the service unto you in your precious son's name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's good to be back with you this morning. It's an unexpected pleasure, but as director of missions, I often get those late Saturday phone calls, <laughs> say, hey, can you come preach? And uh, it was my honor to do that. This morning we're talking about, you know, there's a lot of things in our culture that we're challenged to reimagine. Uh, reimagine education, reimagine law enforcement. That one always makes me a little guarded. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about reimagining the church, and specifically, we're going to imagine a church where everyone is welcome. Now, when I was a kid, I was never into sports much. My thing was music. But I knew a lot of people who were a part of sports teams in high school and college, and they loved the camaraderie that came with being part of a team and winning a game together or state championship or whatever. Um, the feeling of belonging to a group or something, being a part of something that was uh, exciting and important. Uh, for me, I experienced that feeling in between my junior and senior year in high school when our symphonic band uh, was invited to Vienna, Austria to participate in an annual youth and music festival and competition where bands in high schools uh, and colleges actually from all over the world would come to Vienna, the music center they believe in, in uh, uh, that region of the world, and, and they would compete for prizes and, and top position and I remember our band uh, working extremely hard for over a year, uh, practice upon practice, uh, and we ended up going to that competition in 1975 and won both major awards. Um, we were then rewarded with an amazing opportunity uh, during that time. We got to play a full concert in the Music Verein uh, Golden Concert Hall, the main concert hall in Vienna, Austria. And that concert was then aired uh, and broadcast over Radio Free Europe. Uh, it was an amazing experience for a young teenager and, and something that I and the people that were in that group will never forget. But I want to ask you this morning, what about you? Do you re ever remember a time where you were included in something or in with a group of people and it made you really feel like you were a part of something special? Uh, maybe it was a youth group at your church when you were growing up or a civic group that you got involved in. Uh, maybe you were on a sports team and you forged some really great friendships that then have lasted a really long time and then had a positive impact in your life. Um, when you go into a situation or you become a part of a cause or a group of people who, when you're there, they say to you, we are so glad that you're here with us. We, you, you're welcome to be a part of us and what we're doing. That can be very powerful. But if you're like me, you also remember the pain that comes when you try to get into a certain group and you're rejected. I, like I said, I was never really into sports. In ninth grade, I got into the wrestling team. It was the only sports I ever did in, in school. Uh, but they, I actually made the team because they needed somebody in my weight class. <laughs> so, but... Maybe you tried out for the basketball team at your school and you got passed over. Or, or let me give you a, an analogy that's probably a lot more relatable. We all know the joy 
that happens when you're on 270 and you're on your way home and three lanes merge down into two and you signal to get over and the guy actually lets you in. <laughs> and as you're coming over and he, he's motioning, come on, it's okay, you're one of us, right? But we also know the rejection that comes when that car crowds your car out as if to say, hey, you should have merged back there. And I'm not letting you in. You are not coming in with us. Now, whether you get that feeling by belonging to a church family or your own blood family, or I remember as a kid uh, having a best friend, and his, we used to call his mom and dad my second parents. And I could just go over to his house anytime and open the door, and we had to go through the kitchen to get to the living room, and I would open the refrigerator and help myself to whatever was in there. You think, boy, what a brazen kid, right? But that family made me feel like, you know, it's okay, you're part of our family, come on in. The, the chance, though, of being rejected in a situation like that can be painful, can it? And humanity has a way of dividing people up, doesn't it? Between us and them. Between Russians and Ukrainians, Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals. Who's in our group and who is not? And it starts happening when you and I are children. And honestly, I don't think it ever ends for the rest of our lives unless we're intentional about changing that. So we're talking today about imagining a church where everyone is welcome. You know, for generations, philosophers have wondered, how is it that Jesus took three years of ministry in Israel and exploded it into something that would last for thousands of years and would eventually encompass the whole world? And I'm convinced that one reason... Christianity has stood the test of time is because it is God's plan for salvation that was clearly and finally open to everybody in the world, Jews and Gentiles, men and women, white and black. Jesus redefined God's goodness when he appeared on the planet in human form, and he told us there is no hierarchy like religious people often think there is. Because nobody's perfect. We all need a Savior. And that's who Jesus is, and it's why he sacrificed himself on a cross. Now, I work with about 36 plus or minus churches in our association. And I have the opportunity occasionally to work with churches outside of the Blue Ridge region. And I've been analyzing the last few years the attributes of several churches that have made remarkable strides in the last few years. I'm, I'm, I mean, their baptism numbers are up, their church family is growing, and they're much more effective in outreach uh, than they were a few years previous, okay? And what I have found is that those churches, for the most part, are living out three truths that literally change the way their church relates to people. And I believe if your church adopts these things too and really runs with them, you will see growth like you have never experienced before. The first is that the church needs to be a safe place where everybody is welcome. The second the church needs to be a place where we admit none of us are perfect. Not one. And the third is that the church should be a place, listen to me, where anything is possible. The scriptures tell us that nothing is impossible with God. Do we believe that? Do we pursue things in light of that? 
And I'm here to tell you this morning that revitalized churches that have increased their impact, all three of these things are at work in tandem with the power of the Holy Spirit. So today I want to look at the first attribute in that list with you because I believe it is so important that if you want to be a church that is truly reaching out and evangelizing the lost, you have to be accepting of all people. So Southland, I want you to just think about something this morning. What is it that your church does intentionally that makes people feel like they are really genuinely welcome here? And why does that thing that you do matter so much? Listen, it matters because we have a God who loves everyone. It's just that simple. Everybody matters to the Father. I'll never forget how many uh, times I looked down on, on a certain group of people when I was a Christian and a young man and a deacon in my church and a policeman. I would go out and work the night shift and make an arrest for drugs or for assault and battery or whatever, and each and every time I made the arrest, I would look at the person I was taking to jail and say, this person is a lower class person than I am. I'm wearing the uniform. I'm one of the good guys. This guy's in handcuffs. He's one of the bad guys. You see, it was an us and them mentality. And I'll never forget going to a church leadership conference in suburban Chicago and hearing a pastor say to me, you know, you can never lock eyes with a person on the face of the planet who doesn't matter to the Heavenly Father. And I started thinking to myself, I'm a Christian. I'm a deacon in my church. Have I been getting this all wrong? I had. There are not levels. We're all sinners. We all need a Savior. So the real question for us today is this. Who is actually welcome in this church? Now I want you to think for a minute about the definition of the word hospitality. One writer says that genuine hospitality is making space for someone that you don't have to make space for. Now that's biblical, because it's exactly what God does. When God was creating the earth, he made space on this planet for people. He didn't have to. But we're now a part of God's creation and God's plan for the planet. And God then also created his church. And scripture makes it clear that he doesn't want anyone to perish, right? That he wants every single person to become saved. So then as his church, listen, we must find ways to create a community where there is no more them Everybody is invited to be us, right? Today I want to look at the story of the woman at the well from John chapter 4. And Jesus is going to meet this woman who's an outcast. She's one of them, okay, at the well. And for her and for dozens of other outcasts that she'll eventually bring back to meet Jesus at this well... Life for them will never be the same again. So let's look at John chapter 4. It begins, So Jesus left Judea and went back once more to his home region of Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. And I believe we have a map that will come up on the screen that will sort of illustrate the uh, region here. Uh, Jesus had been in Judea, and there were Israelites there. 
And he's going back up to Galilee, where there were also Israelites, but in between the two geographical spots that he's ministering in is Samaria. It's smack in the way of going north on his trip. And the Samaritans were despised by the Israelites. They were considered half-breeds. They had originally been Jewish people, but over the years they intermarried, they started dressing the wrong way. Is there a right way to dress? They believed the wrong stuff. They didn't worship correctly. Uh, they actually aided Israel's enemies in wars against Israel. And about a century before Jesus, the high priest actually helped to destroy the temple of the Samaritans. So if you were a rabbi and you wanted to get from Judea up to Galilee, you would take this bypass road that would allow a Jewish person to go to Galilee without having to go through Samaria. GPS in that day meant that you didn't always take the route that was the most direct without tolls. You know what I'm saying? Um, it would be like you and I driving around the Baltimore Beltway to get to Hunt Valley uh, rather than driving through downtown Baltimore on a Saturday night after midnight. You get the idea. But when Jesus is going to Galilee, he doesn't take the usual bypass. He says, we're going to take the Samaritan Express. And we're going to take the direct route through town where all of the Samaritans are. And the disciples knew, wait a minute, something weird is going on with this uh, travel plan. Now, there's a really interesting little phrase in this text that John writes. He says, now it was necessary for Jesus to go through Samaria. Why? Why was it necessary? I mean, it wasn't necessary geographically. Sure, it could cut some time off their journey instead of taking the road around, but the phrase that John uses here is the same one that he uses in other scriptures where he's talking about the will of God or an action of God. In other words, Jesus has a divine appointment in Samaria. So he heads straight north and straight through Samaria. Now, this is a scriptural truth that is key to the teaching today. The disciples and people in Jesus' day generally divided the human race into us versus them. And we do today, too to a great degree. But with Jesus, he doesn't agree that there's an us versus them way of thinking. With Jesus, he divided people into us versus, you ready for this? Soon to be us. <laughs> His way of dealing with people was, everybody is going to one day be a part of us. Or at the very least, I want every person to at least have a chance to become a part of the kingdom of God. One of us. So they're going through Samaria, and they come to this well. And here's what happens next. It says, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. Now, I love this wording because in this depiction, because Jesus is not only fully God, he's fully human, right? In his human flesh. He was tired. Anybody here ever get tired? If you don't raise your hand, you're lying. I know plenty of leaders who take great pride in their energy they like being the first ones to start and the last ones to quit. And can I tell you a secret? I used to be one of those leaders. 
Not with Jesus. Jesus actually tells his friends, you know what? I'm tired. I'm going to sit here by this well and rest a little bit. You guys go into town. So this is not a story about superhero Jesus, is it? This is a story about tired Jesus, weary Jesus. And God is going to use, listen, Jesus' weariness. He's going to use his weakness in this moment. In this story, he's not using Jesus' strength. By the way, if you ever think you're too weak or too tired to accomplish something for God, you're dead wrong. Okay? Get that out of your head right now. The place he's sitting is by the well. So we have to talk for just a minute about this setting. There's a really interesting part about this location that most Christians don't even know about in the history of, of the world. There's an author by the name of Robert Alter who's written a very famous book called The Art of Biblical Narrative. If you ever get a chance to read it, it's, it's fascinating reading. Part of what he talks about in this book is that in the ancient world, there would be certain settings where once somebody heard about what was coming in that setting, they would sort of know what kind of story was going to unfold. They would know what to expect. A great example in our day would be if you ever watch a Western and there's a good guy with a gun and a bad guy with a gun, you know what's coming, don't you? Uh, there's going to be a showdown eventually, a gunfight. Uh, there might be some variations on that theme, but the basics are usually the same when you watch a Western. So in the ancient world, Alter says that the meeting at the well was a kind of story where everybody knew what was coming in that story. In the ancient world, a well is where a man would meet a woman, and somehow they would end up getting married. The well scene was usually going to be a boy meets girl story. And this happened all the time in the Old Testament. Alter says that there are certain features that you will usually see this kind of story unfolding at a well. The future bridegroom or his representative travels to a foreign land and he encounters the maiden at the well. And somebody draws water, and the maiden runs home with some news, and the stranger is invited to stay, and all of those features are going to be in this story with Jesus. Well, sort of. <laughs> and like the Western, there are always variations to a story like this. Like in the Old Testament, Isaac's wife, Rebekah, is identified at a well. You remember that? But Isaac is not even there. It's his representative of his family that's there. Rebecca is the one who draws the water for the camels because Isaac is kind of a passive guy, right? And the well story is kind of tipping off what's coming. Then Jacob meets his wife, Rachel, at the well. That story emphasizes how beautiful she was and how he falls in love with her because Jacob is, going, is about to be deceived. Now his history was he was a deceiver. But he's going to be so in love with this beautiful woman, so uh, raptured and captured by her, that he now is going to be the one who gets deceived and then has to work for her for 14 years. And that changes his whole adult life and his character. Moses meets his wife uh, Zipporah at a well. She's just described as one of seven sisters, but she actually uh, has a role to play in Moses' story. So everybody knows, okay, this is a well, this is a boy meets girl situation, but this is Jesus. He's not the guy that you meet at the well and marry. So there's a twist coming. The story you think is going to unfold a certain way, and it does not the way you expect. Why? Because this is Samaria. 
In this story, it's the wrong place with the wrong people in the roles. And they believe the wrong stuff or different stuff, vastly different stuff. They're from the wrong tribe, you know. And then the woman comes, and this is definitely a twist now, because it's the wrong woman. The Samaritan woman comes around noon, it says, to draw water. Now, in the ancient world, and to this day in many parts of the world, uh, getting water is a very difficult task. You ever tried to carry a large container of water? That stuff is heavy, you know? It's a very menial task. And it was often outsourced in biblical times to women. If you had enough money, you would hire a servant to do this job. But listen, she's not a servant. She needs to get water for herself and her household. So one thing we know about her is that she's probably poor because she's hauling her own water, which means she's not only from the wrong tribe, and of the wrong religion, she's also in the wrong socioeconomic group. And Jesus says to her, will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said back to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. See, us and them. This was understood by the Israelites, especially by a rabbi, as they knew what it meant to try to keep the law and keep yourself holy. You just do not connect with one of them. So not only is she the wrong tribe, the wrong religion, the wrong socioeconomic group, but she is also a woman. Now, this is a big deal in the ancient world. Men do not talk to women in public. If you were a husband, you didn't even talk to your wife in front of others in public. And if you were a devout Jewish guy, especially if you were a single man, you would not speak to, touch, look directly into the eyes of another woman. And listen, that went triple if you were a rabbi. Okay? If you were a rabbi, it was your job to stay holy, to stay pure. And the quickest way to get defiled was to come in contact with a Samaritan woman. Jesus is flirting with danger, isn't he? So she knew, no Jewish rabbi is going to have anything to do with me because there was this line between us and them. But Jesus keeps crossing the line. It's really interesting, the dynamic about Jesus and the Samaritans in the Bible. When Jesus tells us so many of his famous parables, he talks about a guy who gets beaten up, right? Right? And so there's this priest, this Israelite priest, who comes by and doesn't do a thing to help him. And then there's this kind of assistant priest that comes by, and he doesn't do anything either. And so the hero of the story ends up being who? A Samaritan, right? Not just any Samaritan. A lot of us know that parable as the good Samaritan. You mean some of those people can be good? Nobody back in Israel talked about good Samaritans ever. Another time, Jesus healed a group of lepers, and there were ten lepers, and Jesus healed them all. But only one of the ten comes back and throws himself at Jesus' feet and worships and says, Thank you. It was the Samaritan leper that did that. And I'll give you a little bonus teaching about this one. After Jesus cleanses them, you know, the ten lepers, he says, go and show yourself to the priests. Now, this is really interesting. There are ten of them. 
and they would just go to the nearest priest of Israel, and he would declare them clean, and that would be it. So that once that declaration was made by the priest, the Israelite priest, they could then rejoin normal society. But why do you think he said it in the plural? He didn't say go to the priest. He said go to the priests. I think it was because the Jewish lepers were going to go to the Jewish priest, but the Samaritan leper would have to go to the Samaritan priest. See, Jesus doesn't even say, now that I've cleansed your condition, if it's going to stick... You have to change religions. He didn't say that to the Samaritan guy, did he? You have to clean up your theology. It's the strangest thing. And the Samaritan leper who is healed just shows his love and adoration for what, what Christ has done for him. Only one out of ten. Hmm. One time, Jesus and his disciples are going through a Samaritan village which is not really receptive to them, understandably. And the disciples, you know, as they're worried about the crowd, you know, kind of getting uh, unruly towards them, the disciples say, hey, shouldn't we just like call fire down from heaven and smite the whole bunch of them? As if they could do that, right? I mean, shouldn't we just nuke the village? And Jesus did what? He rebuked them for that comment. He called them out. Now, folks, you have to understand this about the one that we follow. Because Jesus Christ says, everybody is loved. Everybody is welcome. There is no more us and them ever again. Christ's association with these despised people is so strong that one time some people from Israel wanted to insult Jesus, and they're thinking, what's the worst thing we can say about this guy to really get under his skin? And they ended up coming up with, aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and that you're demon-possessed? That's the worst thing they could think of. So this woman knows that Jesus isn't going to have anything to do with her in her mind, in her historical thinking, in the way things are in that society. And yet, he does. He actually has, with this woman, the longest conversation that he has with anyone in all four Gospels. Wow. Here's what happens next. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. And the woman says to him, Sir, give me this water so I don't have to keep going back and forth to this well. (laughs) No, that's not what she said. So I won't get thirsty and, and have to keep coming back. And he told her, go, call your husband and come back. Now, you can hear almost the dead pause in that conversation, can't you? Go and get your husband and come back. Dead pause. I have no husband, she replies. And Jesus says to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands. And the man that you are now living with is not your husband. Can you imagine being in this conversation at this moment from the woman's point of view? He says, what you have said is quite true. Awkward moment. Folks have often wondered, how is it that Jesus knew all about this? Well, most would agree that it's probably just prophetic knowledge. 
One idea is that maybe there was a guy from the village near the well when Jesus came and sat down, and when he saw this woman coming to the well, he may have said something to Jesus like, uh, be careful before she makes you husband number six. However he knew, he knew. Jesus always has a way of knowing the secrets of our hearts. Now here's the thing about this woman And everybody that you and I have ever known, everybody has a story. Don't they? I don't know what she dreamed about when she was a little girl, but I guarantee you, she didn't dream about cycling through five marriages. Did she? I'm pretty certain of that. Because in the ancient world, a woman did not even have the right to initiate a divorce. We tend to look at the story and think of her as kind of this scandalous woman. But you know what probably is more the truth about her? I think she was a victim. Over and over again, she committed her life to a man who made promises to her and then eventually said, nope, I don't want you anymore. Nope. Sorry, this isn't working out for me. No, you're out of here. Now she's with a man who most likely won't marry her because of her history, and she feels many days like she's hanging by a thread in that relationship. And yet, Jesus treats her with dignity. So the conversation continues. Sir, the woman says, I can see that you're a prophet. Otherwise, why would you know all this stuff about my life? Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain. This, was, this mountain where this well was is where the Samaritans actually worshiped. They didn't go to Jerusalem anymore. They weren't welcome there. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. So she starts to pick a little disagreement with Jesus in the face of him knowing so much about her. And she basically says, wait a minute, you and I are different. We are not the same. You are not the same as me. But Jesus sees someone that he cares deeply about. And so the encounter continues. Yet a time is coming and has now come. Why has it now come? Because Jesus is here in the flesh now. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, and they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. The woman replies and says, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. You see, the Samaritans also believed that there would be a Messiah one day. They had a different language for it. Jesus' answer to her is so interesting. He says, I am the one speaking to you. I am he. He offers her love, acceptance, reveals to her his true identity. He makes space for her at the well when no other Israelite or rabbi would. So it turns out here's the twist in the story. It's not a boy meets girl story. This is a rabbi meets girl story. This, This is a Messiah meets girl story. This is a Savior meets girl story. And nobody knows quite what to do with this. The story goes on. Just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. Bum, 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 right? But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, you have got to come and see this man who told me everything I ever did. Is it possible he's the Messiah? And they all came from the town and made their way toward him. So let's talk for just a moment about what Jesus sees 
when he looks at someone who you and I previously think, oh, no, no, there's us and them and, and them. I don't want anything to do with them. The disciples looked at her and saw somebody who was just wrong, and they didn't need to be associating with that. Jesus looked at her and saw someone that he loved. Here's an important point for you and I to consider this morning. Christian, hear my heart on this, please. Me thinking that I'm right puts me on the opposite side of people that I disagree with. But love puts me on the same side of people that I disagree with. Now, as I scanned this message one more time this morning, I said I should have made a slide out of this, so I'm going to say it again because it's that important. Being right, me believing in my brain that I am right, puts me on the opposite side of people I disagree with. How many arguments have you seen on social media and Facebook that start just like that? But love, Christ-driven love, puts me on the same side of people that I disagree with. Jesus would always look at people with love because everybody has a story. Everybody that you and I could ever know during our lifetime this one life that we've been given, everybody matters to God. Everybody needs to know Jesus. He's still calling people to himself. And he'll continue to do it until the second coming. I love an old joke in Christian circles about St. Peter, who guards the gate into heaven. And Paul is the main administrator. One day Paul is complaining to Peter that as he does the head count inside the gates, it turns out that there are a lot more people in heaven than Peter has actually been letting into the gate after checking the Lamb's Book of Life. And Peter says, how could this be? We keep strict numbers on that kind of thing around here. I want a thorough investigation. So a couple of days later, Paul comes running back to Peter and he says, Peter, I figured out what the problem is, why there's more people inside the gates than we have calculated should be there. We did some nighttime surveillance, and what we found out was at night, Jesus is sneaking people over the wall. Now listen to me, South End, this morning, please. Jesus loves Everyone, sinful people, Samaritan people, Roman people, centurion people, soldier people, poor people, short people, fat people, prostitute people, tax collector people, lame people, deaf, swindler people, abuser people. When Jesus is dying on the cross for crying out loud, there is a thief on the next cross who's being crucified for his crimes, a career criminal. And he says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, Father, I have time to throw one more over the wall. What an unbelievable God we serve. You see, the real question is whether or not South End Baptist Church will do whatever is necessary to be a Jesus church or not. In Australia, they have these giant cattle ranches on the open range. And they have to figure out what's the best way to keep all the cattle on the ranch. And basically, there are two ways to do this. It's so interesting to me. They can either build a fence all the way around the perimeter of that ranch, and it's massive now, okay? 
the, the cost factor for that would be huge. Or the other way they normally do it, they simply dig a well. And what they found is that if there is a source of water, an obvious well or some source of water on the property, the cattle will not stray far from it. It's that simple. They want to keep the cattle on the property. They can either build a very expensive fence or they can dig a well. I have to tell you folks, there are a lot of religious people that are really into building fences. In Jesus' day, the rabbis would actually talk about building a fence around the Torah, around the commandments. And they would make rules and policies that were absolute with regulations like you can't be defiled by coming in contact with a Samaritan because if you're near her, you might accidentally touch her. So they would figure out a rule on how many feet you had to stand away from her if you encountered her so that you didn't accidentally touch her. They would have rules about rules, and they would put fences around everything they could. And Jesus comes and he redefines goodness. And what defiles people or not. Jesus would say it's not what touches a person from the outside. It's what happens to that person inside. Here. Jesus was not a fence builder, was he? Jesus was a well digger. And he said, I have come to give you water, the kind of water you've been thirsting for your whole life, craving. I've come to make it so that you can become a new kind of person, give you a new kind of life, so that you're not dying of thirst all the time. Christian churches have to decide, are we going to build fences? Is that what we're going to focus on? Are, we, are there certain behaviors or beliefs that we can try to weed out by rules and regulations so that we can say you're either one of us or you're not one of us? Can I be real honest this morning? The Baptist church that I was saved in in my teens and that I grew up in would make you sign a covenant when you joined the church that said there is no drinking of alcohol or making a living by selling alcohol. And as a result, late, some years later, when I was a young policeman and I was asked to do a security as a part-time job for a liquor store on the Maryland DC line, I struggled with that as a young Christian. I thought to myself, I'm, am I breaking the rules? By the way, that same church frowned on dancing, but yet some years later when I got married and we had a live band at the reception, I was amazed at the number of deacons and their wives who could really cut a rug on the dance floor. <laughs> By the way, do you know what the difference is between a Baptist and a Presbyterian? The Baptist will not wave back at you at the liquor store. It's okay. It's a, it's a joke. Not a very good one. <laughs> Folks, as I get ready to close, please hear my heart. This, nor any of the churches that I serve, need to be fence-building churches. Every one of my churches I challenge, be a well-digging church. Be a Jesus church. You need to fight with everything in your being from becoming an us-versus-them kind of church. From the bottom of our renewed, saved, redeemed hearts, we should just want people to meet and connect with our Savior because Jesus loves everybody. And Jesus' mission must be completed through this church. As followers of Jesus Christ, we need to be loving and caring and respectful and inclusive, listen to me, to everyone.
Have you ever thought about what Jesus is doing right now? Right this minute. Now, in our selfish way of thinking about things like this, we always say, well, he's hearing my prayers. He's answering prayers. There's people all over the world to pray. He's answering their prayers, listening. But listen, when Jesus went to heaven, ascended to heaven, he said these words to his followers. I'm going to my father. My father's house has many rooms. Hospitality, right? Making space for someone that you don't have to make space for. And he said, if it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I'm making space for you. And as many as you can bring with you. I believe that's exactly what Jesus Christ is doing right now in heaven. And he's doing it for me and you and as many as we can get to go with us. We are charged with doing whatever we can to help throw people over the wall in heaven. And by the way, this eternal reservation came at great cost. It doesn't cost you and I anything other than submission. It's free to us. Because the very Son of God paid for this reservation with his life. He died on a cruel cross to make space for sinners so that we could be welcome and have an eternity together with him in heaven forever. I think of the old hymn, There's room at the cross for you. You remember it? Though millions have come, there's still room for one. I spoke last week to one of our retired pastors who's having some really severe health problems these days. And I said, Bill, how can we pray for you? You know what his response was? He says, if this is me getting near the end of my, my time here, pray that I could convince one more person to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. What a focus for a man who has served Christ his whole life. And as he nears the end of his life, he says, I need to get one more and throw him over the wall. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that in a world that divides humans into us versus them, where there tends to be hostility and bitterness and suspicion, mistrust, violence, war between peoples, where there is at times hatred between racial groups, where there's brokenness in families. Thank you, Father, that there is this intimate family called the family of God and that everyone is welcome here. And Jesus, we thank you that there is always room at the cross and that you still meet people at the well. Change our hearts, O oh God, and make us people who care for others that much too. And this we pray in the one and only name of Jesus Christ. Amen.